I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can join our mailing list and access premium content at CapitalAllocators.com. Three years ago, we released a mini-series entitled Sustainable Investing, The Next Frontier to explore the early landscape for ESG. In the ensuing years, a lot of investor attention has focused on sustainable investing, but differing objectives, measurements, and benchmarks has muddied the playing field. It's a subject I wrote about in a blog last year called What's in a Name? The Problem with ESG. So until those cloudy waters clear up, I thought about turning our attention to a nearly universal area of interest, how capital allocation can improve the climate. This four-part miniseries spans conversations with leading practitioners focusing on climate solutions. We'll hear from hedge fund and climate activist legend Tom Steyer, one of the most long-standing and largest family offices focused on impact investing, and two important strategies in the space, nuclear power and carbon credits. Taken together, we'll learn how some of the top investment minds are working actively to address our long-term climate needs. My guest on the third episode of Climate Solutions is Colin Campbell, a partner at Bain Capital and co-head of the Partnership Strategies team that manages assets primarily for Bain Capital's partners in strategies that diversify away from the equity orientation of the firm's core. In its search for attractive, uncorrelated assets, the Partnership Strategies team became an early mover in environmental markets, which today comprises about 25% of its portfolio. Both Tom Steyer and Bill Orham cited carbon credits and offsets as a necessary and important near-term component to affect climate transition. Colin's deep engagement in the space provides a wonderful primer for those interested. Our conversation dives into Colin's background and investment approach that led to the discovery of the opportunity in environmental markets. We then turn to his investment thesis, sourcing, description and nuance of compliance and voluntary markets, and implementation. Before we get going, are you ready to join the Capital Allocators team? Wait, what? You may be wondering, did I just say an opportunity to join the group of three that makes this all happen? Did I just say an opportunity to join us in striving to compound knowledge and relationships through our shared values of quality, entrepreneurial spirit, intellectual curiosity, respect, generosity, and fun? Yes, I did. And even better, we're looking for someone to fill out one of the most fun roles I can imagine, connecting with all of you. If you or someone you know would like to apply to join Capital Allocators in the newly formed role of Community Engagement Manager, have a look at the job description on our website at the job board or send us an email at team at capitalallocators.com to learn more. Thanks so much for thinking about joining our team to help continue to spread the word. Please enjoy my conversation with Colin Campbell. Colin, great to see you. Ted, great to see you. Why don't you take me back to what brought you to the seat at Bain? Absolutely. Absolutely. First, thanks for uh, having me on the podcast. And uh, I've been a listener for many years and really enjoyed a lot of episodes. So flattered to be with you today. So my background, back in uh, my old college days, I was studying to be an attorney and was a politics major and got the very wise sage advice from my parents to do anything but go to law school. (laughs) <laughs> so I uh, ended up exploring a couple different job opportunities and got some really unique offers, including an opportunity to go into the business world doing sort of a strategy role at the Walt Disney Company. So joined them straight out of college in their corporate strategic planning group out in Los Angeles. And that really kind of opened my eyes to the business world, which isn't an area I had necessarily thought that I was going to move into, really enjoyed that experience and really was a good exposure to sort of the strategy side of business. After that role, I, I wanted to complement that with something more on the finance side. So so looked around for other 
pre-business school opportunities. And the first one I came across was Bain Capital. So this was back in the year 2000. And Bain had the customary pre-business school associate program. And it was a really good fit with what I was looking to do at the time, which is to bone up on finance and learn about investing. So it was a really interesting fit with what I was looking to do at the time. How did you transition over time from being an investor in Bain Capital, as people think of Bain Capital, to this role that you created some time ago, managing some of the capital for the partners of Bain Capital? When I first joined, I was an associate in the public equity group. So this is an equity hedge fund uh, strategy, which back in the day was called Brookside, and we now call Bain Capital Public Equity. So I was in that role for, uh, for almost a decade and really learned the ropes of investing and deep granular analysis that we use at Bain Capital. And after doing that for about a decade, the firm was looking to start a new group in order to find investment opportunities for the personal capital of the partners at the firm. And I was uh, invited to throw my hat in the ring for, for that opportunity. This was right around the time of the financial crisis in 2008. So it was a very dynamic set of circumstances. And it sounded like a, a unique opportunity to me to, to take on a leadership role and, and help grow a, a new effort at the firm and was given a pretty blank slate and blue sky opportunity to go and sort of craft that role and look for different opportunities and have had a ton of fun doing that for the last 14 or 15 years. How did you determine what the mandate would be for that pool of capital? At the time, we had no external clients and it was very easy just to spend time with my colleagues and understand what was in their personal portfolios and, and what sorts of opportunities they were looking for to complement that. And it's no surprise if you talk to the partners at a, a private equity firm, even though Bank Capital had a variety of different businesses at the time, the overwhelming exposure that dominated so many of our personal portfolios back then is equity risk. So whether it was via private equity co-investments, whether it was some of our other business units, many of which sort of lean on or have equity risk factor as part of the exposures you have, or whether it's just sheer ownership and future income from the firm, we were all heavily, heavily exposed to equity risk. So it was no surprise that a lot of what we were craving was investments that are diversifying from equity risk. So strategies that are more in the absolute return and uncorrelated buckets. So either explicitly uncorrelated investments or things that were just less correlated and somewhat orthogonal to equity risk. So it could be fixed income investments, it could be real estate investments, things that were just different than what we did internally at Bain Capital, which tended to be very focused on equity-oriented things. How did you think about the implementation capability of a direct investment shop, whether you wanted to implement directly or look for outside managers? Yeah. Well, early on, we'd had this practice of having some private family office style investments of being a limited partner in, in some external funds. We had the good fortune of having just a, a terrific network of friends and peers and other investment firms that we knew where we had the opportunity to invest. So we started slowly back then by just being a, a regular way limited partner in existing funds in a traditional sort of family office investment style. And what we've done since then is gradually build out the team to be able to increase our implementation and execution capabilities, gradually moving into things like co-investments where we might underwrite deals alongside managers. That was about 10 years ago, starting to seed new investment firms from scratch. That was eight-ish years ago and have now built up the team to be 13 people on the investment team with a broad range of different styles and methods we use to implement our investments, sometimes as, as in partnership with an external firm that we may help grow or launch, and sometimes implementing things directly when we feel like that's the most appropriate way to express a particular bet or investment in a particular market. How did you take some of the deep research-driven DNA that you learned from the decade being on the direct side and employ that particularly in those earlier years when you were looking at LP relationships and outside managers? It's interesting. When I moved over from stock picking to allocating, it ended up being quite a bit more similar than I thought in the sense of, at the end of the day, you're interviewing teams about what they do in their day job and then conducting research to try and build conviction and belief 
around what they're going to be able to do in the future and how they're going to be able to pr perform and either lead their fund or lead their company. Um, so for a good 10 years, I, I had had training and, and sitting down with, you know, the management teams of public companies or, or companies going public and really understanding how they operated, how they did what they did, how they competed against others and doing the necessary research to understand the industry they were in, what was unique about that particular company, what was going to differentiate them and where their return stream was, you know, what are earnings going to be over time? And then supporting that over to the early days of what we did and what we now call our partnership strategies group, it was similar. It's interviewing portfolio managers, interviewing the analysts on those team to understand and what do they do? And how are they different from their peers? What are examples of their work? And really trying to tease out who's going to be able to compete well in their respective industry. The context is different. What you ask them about is different. The analyses you perform are different. But it, at its underlying sort of root nature, it's more similar than I thought. So I've really enjoyed just this experience of being able to port that skill set over and then be able to benefit from just getting exposure to so many different investment managers who have, you know, many of them different approaches and different experiences that inform how they go about underwriting the world. What are some of these diversifying strategies that you've dove into over the years? It's evolved over time. So I'd say in the early days, you know, we were dabbling and exploring what I will call now the mainstream alternatives of things that were just not explicit equity risks. So it would have started with things like moving into pretty traditional real estate investing and commodities investing, whether it's via um, back in the day, oil and gas funds or farmland funds. And what it's evolved into over the last 10 years as we've really developed perspective and turned over a lot of rocks tends to be strategies that are a bit more off the run and that are generally less competed with significant amounts of capital. So I'm talking now about sort of where our tastes run and what we focus on. So these tend to be strategies that are, again, trying to generate returns uncorrelated to equities. Some examples on the sort of trading side would be things like proprietary trading strategies where the underlying traders are not trying to take directional risk where they're trying to either exploit some sort of market inefficiency or trade some sort of arbitrage in order to generate a return in a fairly low risk way. So markets where those strategies exist could be anything from exchange traded futures, which is a, a very large and deep set of markets. It could be exchange traded options, again, very large complex markets with many different market participants who have different motivations, which leads to differences in pricing. It could even be in something as simple as exchange traded equities, but where one has a certain set of skills, whether it's technology or a statistical approach that enables one to sort of harvest return without taking directional risk. So we like those sorts of strategies. We also like strategies that are in more nascent markets where there just isn't significant capital that have yet penetrated those markets and thus where there hasn't been sort of deep exploration to sort of fair value. And we've had deep experience at, at looking at some of those more nascent markets over the last 15 years. So over time, that's included things like investing in healthcare royalties, which when we first started looking at it, there were a single digit number of investors and, and partners in that market. These days, there's you know many dozens looking at all sorts of reinsurance type strategies where the underlying risk you're taking is driven by something that's, that's not cyclical and not macroeconomic. More recently, we've come across environmental markets in the last five years, which we think is another example of one of these nascent markets where there is not significant capital yet and move those markets to what we think is, is fair value as an example. I think that's a terrific context to dive into where we're going to head with this, which is these environmental markets. And maybe the place to start is how did you come across these markets as an investment opportunity? We've been investing in commodities-oriented strategies, whether it's longer-term private equity-style investments or uh, commodities trading strategies for over 10 years. So have gotten to know a lot of different firms in that ecosystem, 
the merchant commodity trading firms, uh, most of which are private, a small number of hedge funds that that tend to focus in 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 those sorts of commodities trading strategies, especially. And it was just in conversations with that network over a period of years that we started to hear people talk about some of these markets, both. Um, there's sort of two types of environmental markets as compliance markets and voluntary markets, but it was just in ordinary conversations about what's going on in different markets that we started to hear some of our friends and, and partners talk about um, exploring these markets. And that sort of piqued our interest and presented us the thread on which to pull to kind of learn more about them over time. And what did you come to as your core investment thesis in the space? At its core, our thesis is um, really threefold. Number one, the world has decided to care about climate change more so than ever before in its history. And we can see all different types of constituencies starting to make behavior changes that we think is going to lead to the evolution and growth of environmental markets. So whether it's governments or corporations or private companies or individual citizens, we're starting to see behaviors where we believe people are going to start to actually do something about this. The second element of the investment thesis is we think we are at that key inflection point in some environmental markets where there is starting to more likely be some sort of significant price change in many of those markets as they flip from being in surplus to being in deficit. So just like any other commodity market, a lot of environmental markets have some sort of instrument that can be purchased or traded. And historically, looking backwards, there has been a surplus of these instruments. And in the window of time we're in now, sort of mid-decade 2020s, we are likely to be flipping into an environment where we're going to be in shortage of many of these instruments. And that's likely to cause a significant price inflection. And then thirdly, on the investment thesis, we think there is likely to be significant growth in investor participation over time. Right now, these are markets that strike us as being relatively lowly populated by both investors and allocators. There's just not that many fund managers that look at this space today or have spent the time to sort of get up to speed yet. There's not that many of my friends in the allocator world that have had significant exposure to these markets yet to be able to even make the choice to consider allocating to them. As we look at the fundamentals of the market and the initiatives that a lot of this capital has with regards to supporting ESG style investments, we think that is going to be very favorable for these markets. So that's really the underlying thesis. You alluded earlier to compliance markets and voluntary markets. What are these environmental markets? I know there's a lot of a lot of buzzwords and a, and a lot of confusion. So let's break it down into these two pieces: compliance markets and voluntary markets. And while we talk about environmental markets broadly, most often we're talking about some sort of carbon market. And by carbon, we mean CO2, carbon dioxide, a greenhouse gas which is in the atmosphere. And we all know the story from there. Let's talk about compliance markets first. Compliance markets are created by a government with the policy objective of reducing emissions. And what the government does is they create some sort of cap on the number of emissions that they're going to allow in a given period of time, so say in a year. And the government caps how many permits they are going to issue which is a proxy for how many tons of carbon dioxide gas they're going to allow for a given year. And the government then requires every emitter of a certain size to buy one of these permits in order to emit that ton of carbon dioxide. And the emitters must comply. So that's why we're calling it a compliance market. The term cap and trade is often used for this type of market where the government is capping the number of tons of carbon dioxide that can be emitted and where the underlying permits can be traded between the emitters, investors, and anybody who wants to participate in those markets. So some examples of compliance markets are, again, these are set up by governments, would be in the United States, we have the California Carbon Allowance Market or the CCA market. It's a cap and trade market that the legislation started about 16 years ago. The trading of these instruments actually started about 11 years ago. And that's one of the, the larger and more liquid markets in the US. It's still a small and niche market 
but that's an example in the U.S. Over in Europe, there is a compliance market that's been created by the EU, and they're called EUAs or EU allowances. And uh, very similar, it's a cap and trade market where they cap how many permits they allow each year and emitters must buy these permits in order to actually emit carbon. And the sort of supply, if you think about the supply in this compliance market, it's a artificially created number that the government decides through a policymaking process of how much carbon they want to allow. And they design the market so that year by year, the number of permits gradually decreases with this, again, policy objective of reducing carbon emissions. The demand in these compliance markets, the emitters, so the emitters are companies like a power company that has a power plant, a natural gas power plant that emits carbon as they burn fuel. It's uh, companies or entities like a factory that has some sort of carbon emission by virtue of their process. It could include a refinery that refines either oil or some other petroleum byproduct in, in order to conduct their business. And those entities are the emitters that must buy these permits. And again, the theme we're seeing in these compliance markets, it starts to get very granular and very different market by market. But many of those markets have been in significant surplus where the number of permits has been greater than the annual demand for them for many years. And we're in a window of time where that supply is being tightened either just by the pre-existing schedule or by new legislation, which is actually tightening these markets in some jurisdictions. And we're entering this window where more and more of these markets are going to go into shortage, and that's likely to lead to a significant price increase, we believe. I want to ask you a couple of basic questions about how these permits work, to just put it in some perspective. So I guess the first is, how precise are these measurements of the emissions that companies are putting into the atmosphere? They are precise enough for the purposes of what this program is trying to do. So each of the different jurisdictions has a certain set of rules around what the entities must do in order to both measure their emissions in the first place to figure out whether or not they're large enough in order to be covered by these sorts of programs, and then on an ongoing basis, uh, measure their emissions to basically uh, make sure that those entities are purchasing enough allowances in order to offset the activity that they have as emitters in those markets. And the precise rules in terms of how frequently and the process vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. But I would say that's not a particularly controversial area of these sorts of markets. Once the programs are implemented, it's generally a multi-year process of both rulemaking and socialization amongst all the constituencies in a market. Trade associations on behalf of the emitters come in and weigh in, and they, along with the technical staff at the relevant regulatory jurisdiction, decide how that's all going to be handled. So we don't see a lot of controversy in those precise measurements. At the end of the day, we see more and more of the emitters actually buying into these programs. And while there was resistance 10 and 15 and 20 years ago, you know, where you would see oil companies lobbying against these sorts of programs, what you've seen in the last half decade is more and more of them see the writing on the wall. They realize we're past the point of sort of no return in in many jurisdictions. And so they're buying into these programs and what they're trying to do is at least influence, you know, some elements of them, but there's less and less resistance compared to what we might've seen 10 or 15 years ago. And again, back to our investment thesis, that's part of what we've been waiting for is seeing a point where even those entities being regulated are going, you know what, it's just the right thing for us to do. Now let's just talk about the precise details about how that's gonna take place. What happens to an emitter if they surpass the permitted allowance they have from their purchase of the permit? This is starting to get into the micro, and it's going to vary market by market. But in one example, let's take California, because that's the biggest one here in the U.S., So what an emitter will need to do is to buy a number of allowances. In California, it's a rolling three-year compliance window, and essentially the emitter needs to buy enough allowances to cover their emissions over that three-year window, and there's a certain schedule associated with when they need to, to buy those. If they don't buy enough, then they are going to be significantly penalized by the jurisdiction. In the program's history to date, there has been 100% compliance, as far as we know, with this program. And that in part has been 
not that big of a, of a lift for the emitters because the prices have been low, relatively low historically. In California, they've been in the neighborhood of $10 to $20 per ton from the time from 2012 to roughly 2020. In the last year or two, you started to see the price creep up to be in, in the mid to high 20s, but still relatively low. And this is the cost per ton of CO2 for these permits. Right now, there is this existing surplus for emitters to be able to buy them. So there's no issue with the, the emitters being able to buy them. But at some point, there will be a shortage. And what will happen then is the price will go up significantly. And in the California market, there are certain price guardrails. And if price reaches a high enough level, there is a cap and it goes up at 5% plus CPI every year. There's both a price floor, which is currently for 2023, $22.21. There's also a price ceiling. And at the price ceiling, if price ever hits that price ceiling, an unlimited number of permits become available to enable emitters to buy whatever they need, but at much, much higher prices than we are at currently. And you know, this whole thread around the pricing dynamics of the California market in particular are actually worth highlighting. And, and it's part of the reason we find some of these markets so interesting is the governments are often regulating price minimums and even escalating price minimums, which can create unique and interesting and positively skewed investment opportunities um, for investors. When you talk about participating in this market, so you've talked about permits, what are the investment instruments that you're buying in this case? There's a couple different ways to participate in many of the, these compliance markets. The underlying instrument is permit, a electronic certificate in most of these jurisdictions that is issued by the regulatory body. Think of it as you know a permit that you buy. That's one way you can access these markets. A second way in many of these markets, particularly the larger ones, there are exchange-traded futures, which reference the underlying certificate. So one can buy exchange-traded futures, for instance, that reference the CCAs, the California Carbon Allowances. And those futures settle physically, which means at the expiration of the futures contract, the person who is long the futures contract actually gets a certificate from the person who was short that uh, particular future. So the pricing between the futures and the underlying instruments, because they settle physically, needs to converge at expiry. And so what we often see is, is financial market participants accessing these markets via financial futures as opposed to the permit itself. But the two are very, very closely linked in terms of price. How big are these markets today? The size of the specific market will vary by the jurisdiction. The largest compliance market in the world is the EUA market. For that market, we see annual trading volume of futures in the hundreds of billions of dollars, which sounds kind of big, but that's a relatively small niche commodity market. In California, the annual trading volume of the futures is in the tens of billions of dollars, an even smaller commodity market. And the underlying permits in California is single digit billions of dollars. So these are not tiny, tiny markets, but I would say they are absolutely small and niche relative to traditional asset classes like equities and fixed income, and much, much smaller than what I'd call more competed commodities like oil and gold and natural gas, which tend to be in the trillions of dollars of annual turnover of the futures contracts. So we see the size of these markets and the compliance side growing. The volumes of actual permits come down over time, but we believe price will be growing as the shortages that we expect to take place start to manifest themselves in different markets. What does the price action look like in terms of sort of volatility and correlation with things like equities, fixed income and commodity oil markets? It's different market by market, but I would say as a general theme, we think about the price action in really two different time horizons. The first is on a shorter term basis, we do think some of these markets will have some correlation to equity markets, especially for the exchange traded instruments where you're just seeing involvement in markets where there are financial market participants in other instruments. So we think inherently there is some modest uh, connection there. While these markets are driven by their own fundamentals, in the short term, there could be some moments of, of positive correlation. But I think the more important time horizon that we use is focusing on 
the medium and long term of what will drive prices in these markets. And that's the fundamentals of each of these individual markets, the supply, the demand, the regulatory changes that are occurring. And we believe the price action that comes out of those fundamentals is uncorrelated with the equity markets, with the macro economy. And there's such a unstoppable secular trend, it seems, of these markets being penetrated by investment capital and more and more regulatory changes that are bullish on price in these markets, that we think that happens and is likely to to continue regardless of what's going on in the broader market. So that's the time horizon that we think about for thinking about price action. On a day-to-day basis, the price action between the markets, it can and should be independent of each other in light of the fact that the fundamentals are different market by market and where each market has its own supply and demand fundamentals, its own regulator, which is governing the different compliance markets. The general theme is that we feel like it's early in the life cycle of these markets and where some markets are at or relatively close to regulatory price floors and where in some of these markets there is the potential for greater increases than there are declines. So as we look at these markets, we think now is a very interesting moment to be looking at them in light of the relative lack of investment capital in some of the instruments in these markets. What kind of volatility do you have to withstand in the short term to get to what you're playing for over time? If you look statistically at the annualized volatility of some of these instruments, I would think of it as, you know, while these are commodities, it's something like a modestly volatile single stock equity. So you're looking at annualized vol that could be in the 30s, something like that. Perhaps some of the markets more volatile than, say, an equity market index. But it really depends on the market. For a long time, the California market had very low volatility because for most of the last decade, the price was at the regulatory price floor, where basically the auction prices couldn't go down. The futures were trading right around this price floor. So you saw it really as almost a flattish price gradually escalating with the minimum price escalation, which is 5% plus CPI per year, with relatively low volatility. It's increased somewhat as prices come up off the floor in California, but still relatively modest by commodity standards. And I think if you're using the time horizon that we do, we think the volatility is modest in light of what we think the return potential is. So the sort of implied sharp and or sortino one might be thinking about as you think about, even though it's just a single instrument in a given market, if you thought about it sort of as its own strategy, it's something that we think is quite attractive and stacks up relatively well to other investment opportunities one might consider. So before we turn to the voluntary markets, a kind of a structural question about these compliance markets in that carbon emissions don't follow a state border. So how do the regulatory regimes think about, so you have a California market, but you may not have a Washington or an Oregon market. How does that all fit together? Clearly, leakage across borders is an issue that the regulators and that the technical teams that design these markets think a lot about. I would think of it this way. The compliance markets effectively cover stationary emitters, so things like a factory, which doesn't move in and of itself, a refinery, a large power plant, for example. Now, while the emissions themselves may float around in the air, of course, and around the globe, the idea is sort of what is that particular jurisdiction's contribution to that sort of global pool. And there are specific regulations that deal with like the importation of power across state borders, for example. So if you have a state program like California does, the program specifically contemplates the fact that emitting power physically in California might be more expensive than, say, emitting next door in Nevada. So power imports from Nevada are also burdened with this same requirement to have an allowance. So the market designers are are very thoughtful and, and do capture those issues. I think there's the broader public policy issue of, are you going to be one of those either countries or subnational jurisdictions that's a free rider on what other jurisdictions decide to do? And again, what we see is just a broad secular trend towards everyone talking more about and caring more about these markets. If, if one looked at a map of the world and identified which jurisdictions have these markets. You know, we see a few markets globally. You know, there are several dozen. Some of them are, are state markets. In Canada, they're provincial markets. And in Europe, it's an, an, almost an entire continent. But there's still a lot of white space. 
right now, but what we see are more and more entities teeing themselves up to also have these compliance markets. So in the US right now, for instance, the state of Washington is about to have their first auction in February of 2023 with their own cap and trade program, which they have never had before. The state of New York, which is already part of a regional group on the East Coast called REGI, which covers the power sector, is considering legislation to expand their environmental market coverage to cover different sectors of the economy. So we see more and more jurisdictions, more and more industries being regulated, which starts to address this issue of some jurisdictions have it, but others don't. So let's turn to the voluntary markets. So what are the voluntary markets and how do they work? So voluntary markets are the second side of environmental markets. And per their name, these are markets where the people who are buying the underlying instruments are doing so completely of their own volition. So there's no government requirement that they buy um, the underlying instrument. So what is the underlying instrument in, in voluntary carbon? There's a lot of vocabulary you, people may have heard, things like a carbon credit or a carbon offset or a voluntary carbon credit. Let's just use the term a carbon offset. And when someone is participating in the voluntary market, they are basically saying, I want to buy something to offset the impact, the carbon emissions that I have had on the world. So I've already done some activity. Let's say I took a plane ride on a jet and that used up some fuel and some share of that is due to me. I want to offset that behavior by buying some sort of instrument. So it's something I'm doing totally voluntarily. No government says that I have to do it. And these offsets need to be created by somebody who is undertaking an action in order to have that offset impact. And there's really two types of voluntary carbon offsets. There's offsets where you undertake a specific task in order to remove carbon out of the air. So an example of that might be planting a tree. If you plant a tree, the tree will grow. It will absorb carbon dioxide out of the air as part of its growth. So that's one way you can create a voluntary carbon offset. Another would be by avoiding some activity that you would have done otherwise that might have emitted some sort of carbon. So an example there might be in a developing country, you might be a family that historically has just burned firewood in order to cook your food. But if you all of a sudden have a modern appliance, let's say at the UN and, and, or some NGO gives you a modern appliance to be able to cook your food more carbon efficiently, you are now avoiding an emission you would have emitted otherwise. So those two types of projects, removal projects and avoidance projects, both of them are entitled to issue a certificate, basically an offset. And once those certificates are issued, they go through a verification and registration process with a third party. And once that occurs, then there may be someone who wants to buy them, again, myself, let's say, or a company or a government that wants to offset their carbon footprint. So those are the underlying instruments, but I, I would say this is a market that is by definition far less structured with far fewer formal rules around it. So the analogy I like to use is it's a bit like the wild, wild west, where nobody really knows for sure what exactly the shape of that market is going to look like over time, because again, by definition, there is not yet government legislation that's requiring participation in those markets. So what we have seen is a very, very disparate set of opportunities in the voluntary markets, many of which are interesting, but many of which are also not interesting, both as actually doing good in the world, as well as an investment opportunities. And like that, the headline point I think I'd make on that side of the environmental markets is it's far less structured and people need to be very wary of different instruments on, on the voluntary market side of things. Is there a centralized depository, you think about an exchange or something like that, where these various certificates that get issued come together to trade? On the voluntary side, the answer is no, not yet. And there may never be, just given the natural decentralization of what this market is. We're using the word market to imply that there is one, but the reality is it's very much over-the-counter bilateral type relationships 
where let's say the project developer who undertook the project to issue these offsets might be selling directly to an end user, or they might be selling to a broker or some other intermediary who may be selling it on to, to an end user. So it's very much a kind of off the screen OTC type market today. There are a number of registries, which are the verification bodies that have developed in order to basically vouch for the offsets. And there, think of them as really the audit um, institutions that come and make sure a particular project developer has done what is needed in order to be able to issue the offset. So these are companies like Vera and Gold Standard, and there's you know half a dozen others where the world seems to be gradually gravitating, but they're not exchanges per se. They're more the good housekeeping seal of approval of, yes, this is a project that actually did what they said they were going to do. In the last year or two, some of the commodities exchanges have introduced exchange-traded futures that cover voluntary carbon markets, still relatively low liquidity for those instruments today. And in light of the underlying heterogeneity of different voluntary carbon offsets that are associated with many, many different projects in many, many different countries, it's very hard to have a standardized exchange traded standard that really captures all of the nuance and all of the diversity of the underlying certificates. And it's not entirely clear that this market will go the exchange traded route in the same way the compliance markets did. Because in compliance markets, they're all interchangeable. They're all exactly the same thing. Whereas in voluntary carbon markets, one of them might be, well, this offset was because you helped regrow a forest in the Amazon. And another one might be, well, you help provided cook stoves to low-income families in Kenya. And another one is because you helped grow some mangrove forests on the coast of Indonesia, all very different underlying projects. And the end users might have different preferences for which specific voluntary carbon offsets they want. So for instance, Bank Capital, as a private company, we've been buying these voluntary carbon offsets to offset not as an investment within my group, but where we've been buying them as a company for the last three years in order to offset our own corporate footprint. And we have this preference of wanting to buy them in the jurisdictions where we do business. So those are very specific micro preferences, and we need to buy voluntary carbon offsets to match that footprint. An exchange-traded product won't necessarily give us that level of visibility into what we're actually going to be delivered when that future's contract actually matures. So it is a diverse market. It's in in many ways still much earlier in its development than some of the compliance markets. But that being said, it's a very exciting market because of how big we think it, it can grow over time. And we do think over the next decade, the voluntary markets can be quite substantial because of the ubiquity of carbon emissions. It's just everywhere. So we think as more and more of the world actually say, you know what, we're going to start to figure out how to offset the emissions that we still have to do, even after we try and reduce the emissions as much as we can, then we think this market will, you know, will be needed in order for people to sort of buy these offsets to undo the carbon footprint that still just needs to occur. How do you think about the return and risk characteristics in the voluntary markets? It's a great question. There's a wider band of both return potential and risk in the voluntary side of things compared to many of the compliance markets. There's just a broad menu that one could pick from. You could buy offsets that have already been issued. So that's relatively low risk. They've already been produced. They've been verified by a third party. You can figure out roughly the prices where those trade. And there's also much earlier stage opportunities where you could work with a project developer who is undertaking a project where they have a 20-year plan in order to, let's say, reforest a, a certain section of the Amazon, and where by virtue of undertaking that project, a greenfield development project, that project will issue these offsets starting, say, in five years from now, once enough trees grow that you can validate how much carbon has been removed from the atmosphere. So it's really quite a, a broad menu of different investment opportunities available. There's been a lot of news and press recently around the validity of different voluntary carbon offsets and their legitimateness at actually having impact. We're finely attuned to that in what we look at. And we think it's very important for allocators to really think about that as they look at this space and and users ultimately are very focused on this. So if you're effectively trying to 
develop and create product and commodity that you're going to sell to the end users, you need to make sure that there's product market fit. Clearly, it's one of these examples of these nascent markets and nascent strategies where the long-term secular trend seems very clear to me, where there is not yet uh, tons of capital populating this space, sort of fairly pricing the opportunity set that's there. But at the same time, I do feel like these strategies are fundamentally doing good for the world, which just helps me sleep that much better at night. Helping to finance offset projects is going to help, say, remove carbon out of the atmosphere. That's good for the planet. It's good for our species. Our firm is a big believer in being very ESG aware as we do our investing at, at Bank Capital. And you know, on the compliance side, helping the policymakers achieve their objective of reducing emissions from their emitters by being part of that market and participating in that market, which is explicitly contemplated by the market design in order they want investors to be in these markets, to be able to more efficiently price these markets and drive efficient price discovery that much sooner. It's this unusual confluence of attractive investment opportunity and something that you feel really good about participating in because of sort of the impact it has on, on the world around us. As you mentioned, there have been some high profile instances recently of the projects that are creating these carbon offsets, not producing the benefit to the environment that they implied that they were going to and then sold off. How does that activity impact what happens in the voluntary markets? Bad news is generally not very good for any market. And I'd say this is no exception. Just to catch up for for listeners who, who may not have had as much exposure, there have been a number of press articles, everything from a, a big piece in the Guardian newspaper in the UK a couple of weeks ago to John Oliver had a great segment on it in late 2022, talking about the dubiousness of some voluntary carbon credits. And when we first started looking at these markets starting you know, three or four years ago in, in detail, it became very clear that there is just significant heterogeneity in the quality of what different participants were doing, particularly on the voluntary carbon market side of things. And one really needs to be careful with what you're buying, who you're partnering with. So whether you're an end user who's trying to offset emissions, whether you're an investor who's going to make an investment in this space, need to understand all of the nuances that exist within the voluntary carbon markets. And the negative news you would think is probably going to make the end users just take more time in assessing what to do and may slow down some of them from pulling triggers quickly. I don't think it significantly alters the secular theme or the trend that's happening. It just speaks to the fact that it is a bit of the Wild West. When you've done your research on both of these markets and you decide you want to participate, how have you thought about whether to do this directly or partnering with managers who are focusing on it? That's a great question and I think speaks to the flexibility we use within our group where we're open to different models. When it makes sense, we will express investments and bets directly, but we're also willing to partner and JV with external parties, whether they're fund managers or developers, as the case may be. We've utilized both approaches and particularly early on, you know, we often look for river guides to be our partners as we explore these markets. And I'd say we've, at this point, think we've developed enough knowledge in many of these markets to be able to express bets directly in some of these markets. In some uh, investments, we're more likely to use a third party in what we do, particularly on the voluntary carbon side of things, where even if we sort of vertically integrate and go way up the supply chain, we're not going to have a team doing the development project in Indonesia ourselves. We're going to be partnering with a local developer. So very much like one in sort of allocator parlance, one might partner with a local operating partner in order to actually go and implement a real estate strategy or a permanent agricultural plantation strategy. We will be partnering with developers on, on the voluntary side of thing in some cases. And you know we'll take it case by case and, and look at different markets. In some markets, it'll be so transparent to us what's going on. We don't necessarily need a fund manager river guide, but you know we're, we're flexible and um, we try and use humility when we assess like what can we do directly versus partner with a third party who may have some expertise that we don't and have tried to strike a balance between those two different models. How do you construct a portfolio in this space? We're trying to find a mid to high single digit number of investments 
that can create a modestly diversified fund that can really capture and harvest this theme that's going on in both compliance and voluntary markets. We don't think extreme diversification is necessarily needed because we do see quite a bit of differences in terms of how attractive different markets are. So what we're not undertaking is what I would call like a naive beta approach to this market where we're going to kind of be in everything no matter what. This is very much a sort of market pickers opportunity or sort of a stock pickers type opportunity where you want to cherry pick the markets that are the most interesting at current prices and given the current fundamentals and regulatory regimes. And where over time, we believe that may change in particular because there's new markets being created and those might be more interesting than the markets you could have invested in yesterday. So we think having a multi-market dynamic approach that's looking at each new incremental opportunity as they come online, reassessing what you want it to look at, sort of high grading it to be like mostly best ideas, but still not having it be just one or two markets. What type of resources do you need to deploy internally on your team to first get up to speed and then stay on top of all these developments in this space? For us specifically, we wanted to understand these markets granularly. So even when we were thinking about using external parties to be our agents and investing in these markets, we wanted to understand them ourselves. So we deployed our investment team. I think everyone on our 13-person investment team touches these investments in some way. About half of us are spending a good chunk of our time looking at these markets. So we have six or seven people focused on underwriting in the first place. That takes a process of two to four months, depending on the complexity of the market, where again, we'll go and hire a consultant or an advisor to help us who is very well versed in that market, if not involved in the sort of architecture of that market. So research is an important part of what we do. And not only doing that up front, but over time, having enough bandwidth to be able to monitor what's going on in those markets over time. These aren't stocks where there's necessarily like could be major news in in any given quarter. There are news developments and there is price action you need to monitor. But for the most part, we're only getting involved where we feel like the situation is relatively stable, where there's unlikely to be stroke of the pen risk and meaningful regulatory change that would sort of fundamentally change the rules of the game and or where the supply demand situation is really a question mark. Like we're involved in markets where we look out a couple of years and say, this is going to get very tight and we think price needs to be a lot higher. So that doesn't necessarily need daily oversight in the same way you might if you were monitoring a public stock like I did for my first decade at Bank Capital. So there's that research resource we need to deploy. What are the operational requirements to participate in these markets? If you're going to do these trades directly, you need to have the operational capability. So if one is going to participate in a compliance market and actually buy the certificates, you generally need to open a special account with the regulator. So it's it's much more complicated than opening an account with Robinhood. It's uh, it requires months of paperwork, you know, legal advice. In some of these markets, there's actually extended wait periods in order to get access to the market. To us, that's another sign that there's lots of capital waiting to get into these markets because it takes, again, pick your market, it takes a period of time to actually get approved to participate. If you're trading futures on the underlying certificates, that also is a very involved process because you need to have an account with an FCM broker. You will likely need to have CFTC registration in the US to trade exchange traded futures. So it's a non-trivial thing to actually trade futures yourself. We work at Bank Capital. Our firm's been around 40 years. We have lots of operational resources to help us figure that out. If one were to look at it as an allocator, what do you need? I mean, it's really whatever comfort level you need about investing in a new opportunity. So whatever research bandwidth you need. And then there are investment funds that are out there that have been set up that act and feel just like any other investment fund might might be. And so it would be some, you know, an allocator's normal process to underwriting a manager, a strategy, and it's not any more operational intensive as a fund investment, let's say, than investing in a hedge fund or a private equity fund. All right, Colin, well, you've listened to enough of these to know that I'm going to ask you a set of closing questions. So why don't we dive in? What is your favorite hobby or activity outside of work and family? My family, we're big board game players. So my wife, my kids and I, we like playing board games. It's I know it's kind of nerdy, um, but it's a lot of fun. We like teamwork games. We like long-term strategy board games, but that's uh, just fun activity and one that's great to do, whether you got half an hour at the end of the day or six hours during the holidays to do together. What's the current family favorite? 
it depends on who you ask. I, I would say the consistent favorite is is a game people may know called Ticket to Ride, which is a game we started playing when our kids are, are young. That's a classic. We like that one. More recently, my two sons have gotten into a very long play a strategy game called Twilight Imperium. It has nothing to do with vampires and the like, but it's uh, it's a lot of fun. What type of investment do you gravitate to like a moth to the flame? I really like very high risk-adjusted investment strategies. So I think a a prototypical example would be like a low-risk arbitrage. So something where you can earn a very low-risk 15 or 20% sounds a lot more interesting to me than something where you're going to take very high risk to get something in the low 20s. All you have to do is find them, right? That is the tricky part. That is the tricky (laughs) part. That's what what we in the team uh, in our group are, are trying to do, trying to do every day. What's your biggest investment pet peeve? I don't love when investors don't distinguish between beta and alpha. So early in my career, it wasn't something I necessarily had a profound appreciation for. But over time, both in the equity markets and then certainly in the last 15 years, have come to develop the framework that many others use and think about really disaggregating what drives returns. Is it a beta? Is it a common beta? Is it exotic beta? Is it a style factor? Is that a common style factor or real style factor? And what is true alpha relative to particularly the common betas and common style factors? For me, when people sort of talk about returns and sort of treat it you know, very superficially, it's all about unpacking what's really embedded in, in that return and overlooking the value of like true differentiated alpha is something that on the margin, I'd say, annoys me. Which two people have had the biggest impact on your professional life? I've been very lucky to have so many terrific partners at at Bain Capital over 22 years. It would be hard to, to point out just two, but I would say Dom Ferrante very early was a terrific mentor, led our public equity business for many years, and I had the privilege of working with him for a good period of that time. And then um, as I moved into this role 15 years ago, Ed Brakeman um, was another partner at Bain who also had, had previously worked in the public equity business, was a terrific river guide for me and, and mentor as I started to learn the ropes of the allocation space. And then many, many others um, from our private equity business, credit business, just been very impactful. What was the most challenging moment in your career? Early in my career, when you're young and still figuring it out, um, having your first big, big, deeply researched stock call go against you and go wrong leaves a mark and and sort of makes you never want to feel that again. In the mid noughts there was a particular uh, company that I had done significant research on and ultimately didn't end up working out. And there were a couple key moments, you know, earnings calls where things didn't work out, changes in management that were unexpected. And it really made me question, like, how well do I know this? And luckily that turned out to be uh, less frequent um, than things that I did that ended up working out well, but that certainly left an indelible mark of really never wanting to feel that again and, and motivating me to you know, really try and, and have thorough understandings for different investments that we look at. What teaching from your parents has most stayed with you? My father had a saying he loved that's always stuck with me, which is there's three types of people in the world. There's people who make things happen. There's people who watch things happen. And then there's people who wondered what just happened. And you definitely don't want to be the third one, Colin. And it's up to you to decide whether you're going to be in the first camp or the second camp. And I I like both that framework of thinking about, you know, the type of impact one can have and the type of motivation one needs to have, but also the fact that it was presented to me as an option and a choice. And it wasn't so much a didactic, you must do this and be this type of person. It's just like, here's the menu you pick. And both framing it that way and and then really giving me the choice to sort of choose has, has always stuck with me. And if I could share another, actually, from my mom, my mom was one of the first women to get admitted to Harvard Business School back in the 1960s, where she was in, I think, the second or third class of, of students that had women in it. And when she got to HBS, she was really excited to learn, but ended up getting discriminated against by sexist professors and colleagues. The lesson is sort of think for yourself and set your own path. And what she ended up doing was actually leaving HBS in in spite of thriving academically. And her logic was, look, I don't need this to be my own person. I'm going to sort of have my own career and do my own things. That's always stuck with me for a variety of reasons, including the one of which, uh, you know, just, just challenge conventional wisdom, set your own path. That stuck with me as well. All right, Colin, last one. What life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in life? So many things in the world, whether it's investments, whether it's people, countries, cultures are nuanced and different and heterogeneous. And, you know, early on 
in my life, I was just trying to figure out the physics of the world and how everything worked. And, and what turned out to be, as I'm now in my mid-40s, you know, turned out I was using a very high-level perspective. And, and while I did all kinds of granular research, didn't really have a full appreciation for just the volume of different opportunities, whether they're investment or otherwise that are out there. And as I've had more experience being able to see whether it's, again, different asset classes, different cultures, different geographies, meet different people, different styles of investing has really opened my eyes to all the nuance that's out there. And I wish, you know, my, my understanding of the physics as the world has gone from Newtonian to Einsteinium to now hopefully a little closer to quantum, never quite there, but trying to just get that deeper understanding of oh, this is how it really works, or oh, there's that angle I never saw before. It's hard to accumulate and know that early in life, but I'd say as I rear my own kids, I'm trying to explain, to, you know, give them a chapter or two from my textbook on physics so that they can have their own understanding of the world accelerate a little bit from the years and years it took me to kind of get up to speed. Colin, thanks so much for sharing your insights on this really interesting nascent market. Ted, thank you so much for having me. It's been great to speak with you. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the show. If you like what you heard, hop on our website at capitalallocators.com, where you can access past shows, join our mailing list, and sign up for premium content. Have a good one, and see you next time.